Spurger Wagon opportunities for all these all these uh, candidates to work on and get their name out. Now Derek has Derek, did you want to ha have a little time for questions? You guys want to ask Derek some questions? Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, let's take let's say let's say five questions. And these are questions, they are not speeches, okay? I know you guys by now, okay? Thank you. I've got a tip, if it's a speech, just end it with, don't you agree? <laughs> now, so what is your stance on the uh, TPP? Um, so the question for folks who didn't hear it was my stance on the TPP or the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I'm still reading it. It's a big deal, and it's a big deal in a couple of respects. One, it's a big deal in that it affects, this is a, for those who haven't followed this, this is a 12 nation, a proposed 12 nation trade agreement that President Obama negotiated on behalf of the United States. It's a big deal in that it affects 40% of the world economy, but it's also a big deal in that it's really long. And I am actually going through the process of reading it chapter by chapter. Uh, and I'll, I, I'll, I'll tell you, um, I would say that the things that I'm looking at in it, you know, one, I want to make sure that any discussion around global trade focuses on exporting American products, not exporting American jobs. And we're going to see uh, later this month, probably at the end of this month, a report from something called the U.S. International Trade Commission that, um, that has been tasked with evaluating the impacts of this proposed agreement. Not just in the aggregate, but also to look sector by sector at what the agreement means to the American economy. I think second, one of the things I'm trying to get my head around is if there is a economic benefit from this agreement, to whom does the benefit accrue, right? Is, it, is this something that only helps large multinational corporations or is it something that can help small businesses here in Grace Harbor County? And I would say generally speaking, um, our state does well when we sell American products to other parts of the world, whether that be Boeing airplanes or Microsoft software or wood products or apples or cherries or delicious almond roca made in Washington 6th Congressional District. Um, when we sell those products to other places, um, and yet if you look at the history of these trade agreements, they have not always lived up to their billing in terms of economic impact. I will tell you what President Obama says about this. What President Obama says is, large multinational corporations have pretty much figured out how to do global trade. Um, and that his goal was to try to remove barriers to small businesses like those here in Grace Harbor County so that they can sell American products made by American workers to other places. And the challenge you see is right now only about 5% of, well, only about 5 of small businesses export. Those that do pay on average 15% more to their workers than those that don't. But right now, American small businesses, when they try to sell stuff overseas, face a whole lot of barriers. I'll give you a quick example. Nicholas and I were in Tacoma, and we met with a manufacturer in the Nally Valley. And the, one of the guys at the place said, so what do you think about this TPP? And I said, I don't know yet. I'm still reading. I said, what do you think? And he said, well, I'll tell you what. And this is a union shop, a small manufacturer. He said, I got three countries that are part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership that I can't even sell into. And I said, why is that? And he said, they have a requirement that I manufacture a certain percentage of my product in their country. He said, I don't want to do that. I want to make stuff in America. I don't want to manufacture over there. So, so, so those markets are entirely closed to me. He said, the other countries, my product faces between a 5 and 25% tariff. He said, if this agreement can remove those barriers, I'll sell more stuff. I'll make more stuff. I'll employ more American workers. Um, so that's part of the analysis that I'm trying to do is looking at that economic impact. There's another couple issues that I'm concerned about, and I'm happy to talk about, but um, I want to make sure that, uh, I mean, the, the president has said that he wants to have a 21st century trade agreement that has high labor standards and high environmental standards. And I've read it. I've read, I've read those chapters, the labor chapter and the environmental chapter. The words on paper aren't bad, actually, but the question is enforcement. Is there, you know, you can set good... There's no enforcement in it. Well, so, so you can set good rules of the road. The question is, what are, what are our safeguards to make sure there's a referee on the field who blows the whistle if somebody cheats? And that's something I'm 
I'm looking at. That's part of what I have to evaluate. But you know, bear in mind, as 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 Mike mentioned, you know, I got into this because I grew up in Port Angeles and saw the economy crash when I was a kid. So I want to make sure that any decisions that I make are focused on trying to grow jobs and grow opportunity in the district I represent. Yeah. Um, I've read TTP. It's, Good job. It's <laughs> you, should, you should get course credit. It was fat. Yeah. And it took me a while. Yeah. But I'm extremely concerned about provisions which essentially exempt multinational and American corporations from both the reach of our law and our regulatory system. I would find that an almost fatal defect in its current form. So, So um, there's a couple areas around uh, regulation that, that I'm digging into as well. So one is, um, and I think the provision you're referring to is the, what's called investor state dispute settlement, which uh, I think it's probably, it's, I mean, when people raise concerns to me, that's one of the biggies. And it's certainly one of the things that I'm, and listen, I, I'm, I'm uh, doing something that elected officials are not supposed to do, which is just, giving you an honest assessment of how I'm looking at this rather than giving you a bumper sticker answer when I'm still trying to work through it. But so let me tell you kind of how I'm working through it. Part of what I have to wait. So and this gets really wonky really fast, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it. So this, this investor state dispute settlement is basically, basically an extrajudicial process through which someone can challenge a regulation and challenge it as being an unfair barrier to trade. And as your representative, I met with the president about this. I met with him about the, this trade conversation. One of the things I asked him is, so what's the deal with this investor state dispute settlement? Why would we do that? And his response was, one of the challenges that American businesses face when they're trying to sell American products made by American workers is you have nations that have set up uh, unfair regulations that are specifically designed to stick it to American companies selling American products made, made by American workers. They're, they're creating regulations that are a, a discriminatory barrier to trade. I'll give you a quick example. I was meeting with a group in Tacoma and a guy said to me, I bought, um, he's a retiree, he took his retirement and he bought a, a, like a bed and breakfast in an Asian country. And he said, the government, this is not a joke, the government came and took his property, this, the, the government of this country. And I said, what, what did you do? And he said, my only recourse was to sue in the court system of the government that just took my property. And he said, guess how that went? And I said, not well. And he said, not well, I lost. And so the rationale behind this, what's called investor state dispute settlement, is particularly focused on these nations that have less sophisticated judicial systems than the United States. Now, the heartburn that I have and that you raise about this is, one, to me, one of the fundamental roles of government is to regulate in the public interest, to protect us, right? Whether that be for worker safety or environmental protection or <coughs> consumer protection. And that's a, that is an important and legitimate role of government. And I don't want to see anything that would undermine that legitimate role of government. And so. That's part of the reason I raised the issue with the president. Now, here's what he says. What he says is, the United States is currently party to 50 agreements that have this investor state dispute settlement. And the United States has never lost a single case. And the reason for that is because the United States, when it regulates, it doesn't regulate in a discriminatory manner to create barriers to trade. When you have clean air laws in the United States, they apply the same if you're an American company doing business in America or if you're a Japanese company doing business in America. Our clean, didn't we just get sued, Derek, by TransCanada? We, we did. And, and, uh, and one of the challenges with this, and it's part of the, it's, uh, it's among the things I'm looking at. One of the challenges we face is they can still challenge our regulations under this model. They, they have not, in any situation since this has been in effect, they've never won. But they can certainly make us go through the rigmarole of having to defend our regulations. So. And again, I'm kind of walking you through this because you're my friends and you're adults and I want you to understand how I'm, what I'm looking at. But those are the issues that we have to weigh. And I, I, I wish I could stand here and say, I think this is totally black and white. I actually think it's really complicated. Yeah. No, no, 
I would say if it's this big, yeah, it's not. It's really big. And part of what I'm trying to do is I've gone through, you know, so I'm going through <laughs> chapter by chapter, and I'm not just reading the chapter, I'm reading what opponents have said about the chapter, and I'm reading what the United States Trade Representative is saying about the chapter. <laughs> because, listen, this is not going to get voted on anytime soon. But I want to make sure when I cast my vote, I'm able to look at all of you in the eye, and I'm able to look at my kids in the eye and say, I was educated about the choice that I made, and I made what I thought was the best decision. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question, however, along these lines. Sure. I'm concerned about transgenic seeds throughout the world. I don't blame India for not wanting Dow's Roundup Ready soybeans. Yeah. Because when they intrude upon the next field through pollen flow, they can demand payment from the farmers that were offended by their own migration of pollen. Yeah. I don't see how in the world, given the fact that it's this thick, that it's actually this thick. You can't possibly dig down to all of the schemes that corporations are trying to get through the TPP. I simply don't believe it, so I need you to convince me. Sure. Well, so I'm still reading it myself, so I'm not in a position to convince you one way or the other, other than to tell you I'm kind of plowing through it. Um, there is an agriculture chapter that, that is focused on trying to sell American agricultural products overseas. Right now, our, our exports face pretty high tariffs and often face non-tariff barriers to trade as well. But I'm still, I, I confess I haven't gotten to that chapter yet. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, oh wait, you already got one. Let me let me get the guy in the back. Yeah. Well, uh, that that pops up why you're your to go get support, uh, to go get to those people. I mean, the overwhelming are this issue and I have a lot of respect for both of our candidates and for me I'm gonna vote for the Democrat you know I don't want to see Donald Trump be our president <laughs> and I think Senator Sanders I have a lot of respect for he's given rise to a lot of issues that I care a lot about that you just heard me talk about having an economy that works for everybody trying to get some of the dark money out of our politics I think that's very important to the to the process I think many of you know I endorsed uh, Secretary Clinton, you know, two minutes into her candidacy. I was one of the people encouraging her to run. And I did that in large part because I respect her experience and as the dad of two little girls, I, I love the idea that they can grow up in a country with the knowledge that they can be anything they want, including President of the United States. And listen, I, I get that there's people who disagree with that endorsement and that assessment, but I'm just telling you how, how I... How, sorry. So we can, we can debate if you want, but I want to answer your question and give you the respect of answering it. You'll give me the respect of answering it. So, so that, that's how I made my endorsement. Now, here's the important thing to recognize. In the democratic selection process for nominating our candidate, there's two kinds of delegates. There's pledge delegates that are chosen through caucuses and primaries, and there's super delegates, which constitute about 15% over the, of the overall nominating process. To the woman who's giving her thumbs down, I agree with you. I don't think there should be superdelegates in the process either. And, and, and thank you for your thumbs up. Um, <laughs> honestly, I get a lot of gestures. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, here's what I would tell you. In the history of the Democratic Party, the superdelegates have never uh, overturned the will of the pledge delegates. Since we've had this process, they've never, and if there's a secret room that's trying to figure out how to steal the nomination away from one candidate or the other, I have not been invited into that <laughs> secret room, all right? So, um, so here's what I'll tell you. 
right now, as we sit here today, Hillary Clinton has a pretty sizable lead among the pledged delegates, but there's a lot of voting still to happen. That can still, that can still change, and if it does change, I think you'll see a lot of superdelegates revisit the dis their their choices. But here's here's no, the no, important part. Sure. Yeah. So, but, but here's, so yeah. yeah. I mean, listen. I'm giving you the respect of trying to have a cogent conversation. I hope you'll give me that respect too. I don't get to cast my vote until July 27. All right. So there is a lot of time between the between as we sit here today and the time that I as a super delegate have to have to cast my vote. And if you see a swing in the pledge delegates, we can we can revisit that conversation. But here's what I will tell you. As a Democrat and as the representative of this area, my priority is to make sure that we don't have President Trump. I do not want to have a president that's for discriminating against women. I don't want to have a president that's for discriminating against people based on their religion. I don't want to have a president whose approach is to build a giant wall. I don't want to have a president that wants to privatize Social Security. That is what we need to come together as Democrats, regardless of who our, who our chosen candidate is. And what I'll tell you is, and, and I'll, I'll reiterate, listen, I, I, I didn't get to choose the process for how we nominate our candidate. I will reiterate, I don't think superdelegates should be a part of this process. And for what it's worth, I also think we should have a process that's focused on primaries, not on caucuses. Because, and, 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 I and I don't say that based on the outcome of the Washington State Caucus. I say that as someone who recognized that we had 4% turnout at our caucuses. My neighbors, who are the biggest Bernie supporters you've ever met, couldn't go caucus. And they felt very disenfranchised by that because they got three kids and they work for a living and she had shift. And that was the case for so many people. I think it's time that our party revisit that issue and revisit how we select our home. Yeah. No, that's going to be the last question, so make it. Make it a good one, pal. Okay, uh, I, I just wanted to say that the reason I believe that you're catching this kind of over the super delegate sure. issue, uh, because none of us feel like, like because you were voted in or Jay was voted in, that you have a right to select our presidential candidate, which is the system that's going on with the super delegate. Yeah. But the reason you're catching the heat is that the the the, the media is advertising her to have not 300 votes ahead of her. They're adding another 500 or 600 super delegate votes onto that and making it look like it's, like it's a useless run. And so people are all angry. And it's not your fault. You're not the one that did it. It's the media that's working the people up. And so uh, once people realize that, that you're not a bad guy, maybe things will quiet down for no. And listen, I hear you. And listen, the, 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 yeah, don't you agree, right? Come on, I can clean it up, right? But listen, the, the, I come back to there are, you know, there's been an awesome and spirited campaign for the Democratic nomination. And my hope is that people stay engaged and stay involved no matter who the candidate is. I, have, I will commit to you right now, I'm for the Democrat, all right? I'm for beating Donald Trump. I'm for making sure that the next president who's going to going to nominate probably three or four Supreme Court justices is a Democrat. Yeah. Yes. All right? And so my encouragement to you, if you are if you are fired up about that issue, stay fired up for the next six months between now and election day, not just in making sure that we can keep the White House, but making sure that we are getting a Democratic majority in the Washington State House and getting back a Democratic majority in the Washington State Senate. Because these guys, you know, that you heard from tonight, they need our help. You know, we need to make sure that we have a Democrat in the governor's mansion and a Democrat as our lieutenant governor. We've got a lot of really important races this year. And so my encouragement to you, you know, you heard my remarks when I spoke earlier. I, I, I am energized as a Democrat this year. I am energized 
by the number of people in this room and the excitement in this room, but we got to keep that energy going between now and November to make sure that this is a successful election night come November. All right? Thanks, everybody.